can record. Uh, welcome to this section um, of um, Nadia's MLA intro, intro class in the first year. And it's a, uh, I'm, always, I'm very happy uh, to be part of it. Again, I've been doing this a few times now in the pandemic. And uh, this time it's a little bit different than the last times because um, last times I had only my manuscript to read from now the book is out. And I, this little presentation is a little bit different to the other ones in the sense I'm talking a little bit, it's more like a presentation, not a lecture or anything like that. It's a little bit about myself also, why I wrote this book and um, what I, why I find this important. And um, I think what is important for you guys to know that <clears throat> I have this idea that landscape architecture should be taught multi-sensory, not just with sight observing the landscape, you also need to smell it, taste it, touch it, and feel it. And so I've written the first book globally on this matter, and I've made it available for you as ebook. You have it in the library. So if you don't, if you want to buy it, it's also available as a paperback, not as a hardback, which is really affordable and on my Instagram. Um, if you go there, there is also a key link that it's another 20% cheaper on Routledge. So if you buy it with Routledge, not Amazon, and I highly recommend it. It's been very successful in my classes. I teach a seminar in it. And I thought it would be great for Nadia's student as well, because we're good colleagues. Um, and I think in the future, we cooperate even more. I have other ideas I will talk to Nadia about another time. But um, this multisensorial experience is key in observing the landscape. And I think that's one of the biggest issues. Landscape is, as I said, only observed with sight. But if you can't observe the existing landscape and its context, how can you understand it and how can you design it rigorously? So the idea um, is that this book gives you with assignments, it has got a theoretical part in the front and then with assignments exercises, how to practice this. And now I have to uh, move my slide if it does that. Yeah, here we go. Um, what is important, because I have in my iPad, um, I didn't do this alone. This is a former graduate student of ours, uh, MLA student, Michelle. She's also an urban planner who now works as a landscape designer a and she contributed. And I always like to acknowledge the people who worked in with uh, this book. And so she did all the layouting and so on and also contributed some drawings and also helped with the text because I'm German. So to refine the, uh, the language and make it good. But what is really important when you write a book, it's much, much more complex. Nadia knows this because she's done a lot of book writing and editing. So there's always a slew of people who help you. And particularly, I want to acknowledge the two classes of the seminar who were like the guinea pigs trying out these exercises and then gave me feedback when the book manuscript was written, if that all makes sense. And the other people, as you can see from what I wrote about them, uh, including my partner at the bottom. I just really want to acknowledge them as well. Um, Neda Rohani was a former MLA student of ours who's a landscape designer in the city and she's an excellent sketcher and sketches similar to me. We have done char charrettes. So she took on the sense walk maps, which I've written extensively about. And I had a researcher from China because a lot of the books um, research had to do with China as well. However, and this is really important for you all, I was a very good friend with Cornelia Hahn Oberlander, our master in landscape architecture. And this is a very private photo, one of the last photos before she passed away with 99 and 11 months, just at, uh, when the COVID pandemic was reducing. Sadly, she passed away and we were very good friends. She lives on very close to campus and I went there often for tea and she gave me all my life I've been here uh, in my second career as a professor, I had an office in Berlin and Shanghai before I was appointed professor here at UBC. She was a really important force in, in my uh, uh, career. And I would like to, and I dedicated this book to her because I thought it was timely and I dedicated it actually before she passed away. And it's uh, uh, an important part uh, I wanted to acknowledge. Now I have to move, why is the slide not moving? There we go. While um, I wrote this book, 
we all, and this is very important, start somewhere. When I was a small kid, my granny in the mountains in Austria, very close to Italy, nearly very close to Südtirol, about an hour away, had this log cabin right up in the glaciers. Well, it doesn't look like very glaciers right now because it's summer. And I spent my summers up there with the 60 cows and the outback toilet. You can see it in the back. And she lived in the front and gave people walkers. There was no hipster things. You had to walk. There were no snowboarding, nothing. The, the skis were used to actually get from A to B. There, it was a transportation vehicle. And the 60 cows with the bells, that's where I spent my youth, up on that log cabin. And that had a profound um, uh, impact on my education and career. To show you the scale, that's the log cabin in the top right corner there. And then at the bottom is a, a hotel tourists could venture up to. And now this is all upper ski uh, party techno place. It's totally ruined, of course. Uh, lots of uh, ski lifts go up and half of the, the, the mountains have been razored for skiing. So obviously exactly our um, uh, metier as landscape architects to make it better. Obviously that went totally the wrong way and has obviously destroyed a lot. However, when I was a kid in my lederhosen, I observed the landscape very early and I was taught by my parents. You can see there's a little rope in the hand of my mother um, how important mountains are and that you have to respect them and that they're very dangerous and you have to be careful in them and not go crazy in them and, and tread carefully and thoughtfully. So that was my youth. And with that on mind in the late 60s, I had a really big appreciation already as a child for nature. And I think it is important to know um, water as a child is a fascinating instrument and water has driven my career as Nadia said in my first book about stormwater management. This uh, is uh, one of my favorite images, just to the water flow in the mountains and the sound and the smell when the rain falls and how the water comes down here in British Columbia. It's wonderful. I love to go in the, in the, when it rains into the forest. So water is a tactile instrument. It's not just what you see, you smell it. It's cool when you touch it, it's refreshing. So it's already got three senses. And then it's tactile because it's of its movement. So it, it's actually engaging much more than just what you see. Now, this may be interesting for you. When I was a child, my mother, my father was a stained glass window painter, uh, a master painter. There were about 10 left after the war and he was restoring the churches after they were ruined. And he had a class company. And my mother, she had an art gallery who specialized in forgotten Bauhaus pupil. So from the Bauhaus era and the Dada period, and particularly a Dada, a female Dada artist. There was one very famous one, Hannah Hirsch. That is amazing. She inspired me because my mother had the copyrights and sold these, the, some of the art of this lady. And these drawings were in her gallery and at home. And I saw this. And as a child, instead of drawing realistic, I did the opposite, abstract. Picasso first drew in school. He was taught realistic referential drawing and then went abstract, as most abstract artists did. I did it the other way around. Being a rebel, I resisted to draw realistic and drew abstract forms like this one as a 13-year-old. And that continued, there's a few more images. Um, partially, I put them in the book as well. And then in architecture education later, I learned how to draw referential and precise drawings. That said, as a kid, I used, and if you go on my Instagram right now, the last image is in Palm Springs. It was trying to give a bit of a recognition of my childhood because I saw the folding mountains at the airport and instead of waiting there for the delayed WestJet plane, sadly, um, I sat there and I drew the mountains, but not what I saw physically right in front of me, but how I wanted to interpret them. So that's a really important message for you guys to learn. These are also abstract drawings, very much inspired by Hannah Hech, one of the most prominent Dada artists, the only female one. And uh, she drew these little mini drawings. And these are some of the drawings from my 
time and uh, I was a, a, while I was a child, I think this is in 81, so I was 15, 16 years old, um, where most people would, you know, play PlayStation. But luckily, when I was young, there was no computers. So we were very creative in our work. Now a big shift, a huge shift. I went for education to the United Kingdom. I was educated as a gardener, as a horticulturalist, as an landscape architect, because my father, a master craftsman said, first learn something practical. And I did, and I went there, learned to be a trained gardener, specializing also in golf course maintenance and horticulture, and then went to a horticulture college, did my horticulture education, and then went to Edinburgh to do the, the degrees in landscape architecture. While I was there, the Brits and the United States had a connection. So I could go on a B1 visa to work for one of the real masters. This is Mead Palmer's office in Virginia in the late 80s. He was at that level as Dan Kiley. He won every prize. He's just very quiet. He's not so famous, but he was a founding professor of the UBA program, University of Virginia program, and ran his firm since 1947. And this was his office run by two ladies and myself as intern. And we had the best time of our lives. You can see no computers, pastel powder coloring and pencil drawing. You can see the pencil machines there. And um, it was fascinating for me to see this. So I worked there in the late eighties and that changed my whole perception of uh, landscape architecture. I learned it from the craft. And this pivotal drawing from the craft after I learned all how to express myself was in 1993, this is in Japan. I worked three years in Tokyo as a landscape architect after I graduated. And this is a pivotal drawing um, where I designed with a recent graduate from the AA, a Japanese designer, a Shinkansen speed train station for Sapporo and the green roof on top of it. And what I wanted to show you with this is ideation is what you should be taught. And this is the key. The tools are out there. We are now having artificial intelligence coming in. So in the future, we will have graphic designers and you give them some pointers. So you have even more time to actually generate ideas. Hand drawing on the tablet today is the most quickest way to ideate. And this is a big uh, green, uh, green roof. And that changed my whole career in the sense that, that obviously later on, I was employed to design lots of green roofs. And that made me where I am today. This is a, uh, the, and this is very important difference. This image is zooming in from the helicopter view to show the holistic approach of the idea right down into the site immersion. But at that time, I didn't think about the census. This is 30 years ago. So I was very excited to learn how to draw. And this is one of the challenges. We have to learn all the skills now, rhino modeling and all that, but we are not focusing on the actual important part. And that's where hand drawing comes in because every line you draw is you control it. So you only draw what is really needed if it's efficient. What that little drawing initiated is that was I was the landscape architect for the first in big urban design project in the world in the 90s in the unification process in Berlin. This is the Potsdamer Platz, the first LID low impact design green roof um, stormwater management project I designed together with Herbert Dreisaitl, Atelier Dreisaitl, who did designed the pond. And I designed all the green roofs and the gardens, the extensive and intensive green roofs. And that little drawings I showed you before was the initiator to do this. You have to understand in the 90s, nobody talked about climate resilience. We were aware in Germany that this was an issue. Germany was a leader in this and to collect the water. Um, so, the, but in this, the policy here had more to do that we didn't take drinking water, which is one. And also during construction didn't re um, reduce the groundwater table to the nearby famous park to destroy the trees in the park. So there were other reasons why we had to do these technologies. We collected the water for toilet flushing and irrigation, which was 30 years ago, very advanced and is still the key project. And in my first book, which Nadia mentioned, I wrote extensively about that. After my uh, designing this project, which took ten, uh, six years overall, I had my own office in Berlin for a few years. 
And I also had then an office in Shanghai. We had about 50 people all together. And I was flying between the two uh, and was teaching one day a week. And this is, as you can see, I'm still drawing by hand. And there's the experimentation, computers are getting stronger, Photoshop programs are getting better. Uh, so it was also, look at the screen, how thick that th screen is compared 20 years ago, how things have changed. Obviously no smartphones that didn't exist then. So it's just important for you to see. We started to experiment, these are hand drawings, but we Photoshopped them. So this was the time when the Photoshop brush came out and I was able to add like watercolor experiences. For you guys today, this is all normal because this is standard, but then this was all the hipster stuff and new. And I used these drawings for my competitions. The, in Germany, you have to win lots of competitions to actually get jobs, particularly public jobs. This was for a former uh, watch factory, very big watch factory in the South of Germany. And they designed this huge park area. And this was one of the visualizations. I always in my office, drew all the perspectival views uh, and then had staff to make it uh, help me with the coloring, but I did most of the designing. And I find it extremely important that you understand if you guide people in an office, you must be able to do those things yourself because otherwise you cannot give enough time for the students or for the interns to learn it if you have not learned it yourself as the boss, and that's what you are trained as at the MLA program as leaders, you are the lead in the office. So you need to be able to do those things. I use drawing also as a communication tool. In my office in China, I couldn't speak Chinese. So this is how I got into that. I was invited to help with the Beijing Olympic uh, competition for, one, uh, for the sailing club in Qingdao, which was a former German colony, by the way. Um, and still all the buildings are there and they, the Germans taught them beer brewing. So there's quite a good relationship between China and Germany now. And I was honored and invited to help with this competition. And out of this grew my partnership with a Chinese colleague and I've learned so much. And this is um, me trying to explain in a drawing to one of my professor colleagues there. He was a professor, I was a landscape architect at the time. Um, of what we how how to draw how you know what we're going to do and you can see these drawings are rough but intentionally it's just the language and that's the wonderful thing while then when i had my own office uh, in shanghai we did a lot of projects and i was very respectful to not uh, in, uh, do western architecture there and only help with some ideas and let the the staff there come up with the really good ideas. These are just some representations of the park designs we did. And, um, but what was also important while I was in China, I realized we are teaching landscape architecture wrong because in my office I always had interns. I realized landscape is the five senses, touch, taste, smell, and sound. And this is, image is trying to show that a little bit, how those different senses respond with us in the landscape. I loved it that you know, the atmosphere of these, the, the, the places I visited in China and Japan made me think we need to focus differently how we design. So over many years, and Nadia knows this, uh, and because she did it herself, we taught you know, foundational stuff, perspectival drawings, what you see. And these are, we had, I had a lot of fun in the environmental design program in our undergrad program, which is now called the Bachelor of Design. And I taught uh, 10 years ago, three years, uh, and I still teach in some courses um, as elective, but I taught foundational work because I find it extremely important foundational drawing that the students can see. But while I was doing this, I was thinking, we are still missing something. So I thought, hmm, what can we do? Uh, what can we do? While I was doing this work, Patrick Conning, a very prominent colleague of mine, he developed the charrette system. So we designed a lot of charrettes, meaning you hurdle architects, landscape architects, stakeholder of a city, uh, representatives of the city in a room for four days and design something. In this case, vision for North Vancouver in 100 years. And then at the end, I draw it up. So I got paid good money to do these quick sketches. By the way, this drawing is huge but I had about three hours to draw it. And I was trying to show a bit of a Blade Runner city here, if you know that movie. 
and also, you know, solar cells is the blue and the green roofs and how the city will evolve over this. And you can see that the boats have obviously sails um, to get rid of the CO2 emissions. So this is quite a while ago now, but I did a lot of charrettes. This is in, in Surrey. Um, and so we did all these different projects, but I still realized it's mostly visuals, you know, it's visuals. Okay, that's good, but there was still something missing. And I thought, you know, how can we do this? This is another charrette, not with Patrick. I did it with another architect on the island for water reservoir, bird watching. So the water reservoir for the village is also a recreational park area. But still, I thought, great, that's not going to cut it. In my first sabbatical, I wrote a cookbook, not just a uh, professional academic book, which uh, obviously was the main part, just to loosen up a bit, I wrote a cookbook because I like to cook. And these are the dancing anchovies, as you can see. And I wrote this. And for every uh, cookbook page of every recipe, there was the main stakeholder. Also, sometimes it was a carrot or something of the recipe was drawn. But again, it was still visual. Okay, I started to explore tastes and I explained, started taste. So, but it was still text and visual. I thought this is still not, it's not helping. And then came the pandemic, and I've been working with the tablet since 2013. So the tablet came out, and I tell you guys, it really saved my um, bottom, I have to say. It really saved me uh, because with online PowerPoints, and that's what I will do after this, uh, people fall asleep very quickly. So um, I started animating my lectures on the iPad and drew my exercises and then did exercises with the students, which I will do in a mini one with you guys in a second. But so what I realized, the visualization with the tablet was a very powerful tool. But then I thought, okay, we need another book. We need a book which explains the five senses, which explains the five senses, how important they are. This is a diagram and I showed it before in Nadia's class. That's the structure of the design process, site immersion, recording, analysis, synthesis, ideation, final design. And you can see by the back and forth of the arrows, this is not a linear process. It goes back and forth. You doubt, you go back to site, your idea doesn't work. But the biggest part we haven't taught enough in, high, in, in university is site immersion and recording it. So this, and then analyzing it rigorously to come up with the synthesis and ideation. And the book is therefore going for the first three parts, phases of the design process. So going to the site, sniffing it, touching it, feeling it, responding to it, and then record it with the tools we have today, tablet, smartphone, hand drawing, et cetera. And I think this is something particularly in first year we should you should all recognize that's where we are today. We are not like when I was a kid using sight only. We must address the other senses. Now we have those tools, as I just mentioned, you can use the tablet and you can record audio. You re can record movement, let's say of water and videos. It's all online on my blogs. If you're interested, my off-screen blog, Nadia has all the details for that, but I can give you that later. So what I did, and this is really key, 40% of us, and I teach in the high school, uh, in the education faculty as well, um, gave a keynote last year, two years ago about how important art is, not just STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Art is the same level. 40% of us are visual learners, including myself, not text learners. So guess what? When I started writing my book, these are my private sketches, not for, the not for the publication, how I was going about to write a book on the five senses. And you can see by these drawings and the simplicity, how I try to think through the process of analytical and referential sketching. Analytical ske referential sketching is what you see Analy analytical sketching is what you cannot see. So for example, you look at a building from outside, you see a box, but if you don't look at the windows carefully, you cannot see that it has maybe two or three floors. And that's then called analytical sketches in the section between. So the section is an analytical observation tool. And so I tried to start with very conventional stuff. 
And this is a page from my book. And then went through all the different recording and visualization devices. And by the way, the e you have this as an ebook, so you can later on uh, go in the library and download it and uh, read it. But this is just to give you um, the different tool recording tools you would be using and then how you can visualize with the suggestions. And now this is the key, the sensorial analysis. This is a strawberry. And then it goes through the different kinds of senses. And it's a cognitive process. So you see the, the strawberry, you smell it, you taste it, you touch it, you can hear it squishy when you squeeze it and so on. And then on the other side of the brain happens something synthesis. It's called the perception. So what happens there is that you, it may, when you squeeze it, it may remind you of your grandmother's great cake you had when you were a child. Or the opposite, you picked up a strawberry, ate it, and it was bitter because it was foul or was rotten already because as a child, you didn't know that when it's brown, it's not edible. So it immediately activates this memo memory, memory or the emotions. And this is what is so important. You have to not just look at it practically, but what happens in our brain, and there's a lot of research out. I read a lot about philosophy and about cognitive research in the last 20 years, and, and a lot of research on smellscape, soundscape, touchscape. It's all cited in my book, if you're interested. But what I want you to understand, the strawberry is much more complex to be observed than we think. And that unconsciously, but as a designer, you have to think about. It. So I put this through the same machine with the landscape. So I said, well, there's the view of the landscape. This is my uh, interpretation of an abstract um, view in the Okanagan Valley or something. There's a lake and the smells and the, the moving of the grass, etc. And what happens? Of course, you may not eat it. You could if there was a fruit tree or something, but at least four of the senses kick in. And then they remind you of certain things. And that's what, what happens in that process. So you have the cognitive sensorial analysis process. Um, the cognition, I think, is the most important, what happens in the brain. And you synthesize that, these emotions. And they're part of your design and observation process. And that has not been addressed. I mean, I'm, it's still in the uh, beginning phases, the first book on it. I'm sure there will be more. So I argued, how can we go about teaching students this? So I'm not the first who invented this. There is a guy, Schaefer, a Professor Schaefer in the late 60s at SFU here in Vancouver, who experimented um, with soundscape. And um, he blindfolded with, um, they blindfolded at the early 70s people let them sit there for a while and then walk through Queen Elizabeth Park to heighten the other senses because you blindfolded. And then they had to experience the different sounds. And that helped them, what they then called later on sound, sound walks. And then I thought, oh, that's a really interesting thing. We should be doing this for all the senses, not just sound. So it was important um, and then Westerkamp, who was a researcher there at this uh, 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 university, a German researcher, Hildegard Westerkamp, she wrote this down in a paper. So all these papers are cited in the book and um, made this process of sound walking uh, a, a peer reviewed process and documented it. And I took that on and I said, well, we could do this with uh, practicing in historic gardens all over the world. So I wrote a whole chapter on sense walk mapping, looking at the, some of the most famous gardens in the world from China, that's why I had the Chinese researcher and I know China well, to Europe, to the Middle East and engage the people, the students in those gardens to really experience the senses. And then we wrote a whole chapter and this is just uh, the entrance page for it to teach them about the census. These are the publications and peer reviewed papers I wrote about it, apart from the book, 
So um, if you're interested on my research gate, you can download these um, peer reviewed papers. They are also written in Chinese and English because I published them in Chinese journals. Uh, and the bottom one is a German book, a chapter I wrote for uh, uh, the very important foundation of the, the conservation of historic uh, parks and gardens in Germany, where I argued that the sense walk mapping could be used for the tourists to appreciate those gardens to save them. So I see it also as a really important tool to introduce that as well. On the right, you see a map which I would give it, which I give my students when they do analysis next semester again in the second uh, studio and first year to go around the place when they do their garden and park design to actually learn about those different experiences and start to rank them. Because it's no good to say, oh, there's a smell here, there's a smell there. You need to say, is it a good smell? Is it a bad smell? Is it a strong smell? Is it a weak smell? Is it a fishy smell? Is it a, a smell of flowers? To start really defining and observing the landscape rigorously. Uh, and that's what I call multisensorial literacy. In the old days, visual literacy, there's, and Nadia knows this, in the 80s, there have been fantastic books in North America about visual literacy, which is with drawing. Francis Ching, for example, and the others, which I cite in my book. But I say that's not enough. We need to do multisense, we need to be able to teach the students multisensorial literacy. So on that note, um, that is an important aspect just for you to see. So please understand that um, when you read the book, you will, I've written about it uh, extensively, to expand the term visual literacy, which I did not coin, but I did coin the, uh, the term multisensorial literacy. Now, the biggest part of the book is how do you synthesize when you design using the five senses. So I used an object like a chair. Now, what is important about the chair, how it smells, how it touches, how it feels, this is all fine. So these are the first experiments, how we design a chair. Now, if the person is blind, they don't care about the form of the chair. They may care about the weight of the chair, how it sounds when he can't feel and the scratch on the, on the floor when it moves around, it may be uncomfortable. So totally different design pointers are important. So in my book, I uh, explain that how that is done. And then I do a whole, and you can see these are my first struggles, my notes, how I came about creating this list, how to go about prioritizing certain senses depending on the person who is using the chair and what senses may or may not be working if he's visually impaired, hearing impaired, physically impaired, and so on. For me, this is the essence of inclusivity. This is inclusive design. We talk about uh, you know, color and so on. However, before we talk about those things, we need to understand ourselves and from ourselves, the, the senses as designers and respond to the people we are designing for deeply what they really need. So it is really crucial, I think, that we understand, first of all, in the inclusive design process, that those who is the, the, the equipment you're designing for, and then in the book, I lay this out and how that is done and how do you then respond with your design by the priorities of the senses. And then it raises completely different questions if you're not immediately prioritized by sight. The same goes for a mug. If the person is visually impaired, how can this person fill a mug with hot water if there's nobody around, not burning their hands. So that was the idea here. How can I design a mug which that person can fill alone and be inclusively part of society? Very simple. 
you make the edge of part of the mug thinner and with the finger, they can feel when the water rises hot in the mug when it is full. But if you don't know that and don't think about it, you don't design like that. So this is what this drawing is trying to do. And then I did the next, I looked at people who are visually impaired and I designed a garden for them. What is the most important when they access the garden? It is not that they see it, it's that they smell it. And when they go on the path in it, that they feel it with their feet. And then when they go there, they can hear the rustling of the leaves and the sound. That's much more important than maybe the color because they can't maybe see that. So what is really important when you design, and that's why I use the section in the axonometric to explain deeply how this process works. And these are my first ideation drawings, which I did instead of writing text. So I argue students should do much more of drawing as thinking than writing. When you design, use drawing, because when you use drawing, you see the things you don't see and you can argue much better. Um, the details. And then if you use the drawing more like a thinking tool, like a language, it will help you in your design process. Here's just some more on how I then started to prioritize using these little icons, the different senses and what is important. And then in the book, you can uh, read it yourself. So I did the drawings. But you can see the drawing, loose drawings, all you need. They don't need to be beautiful. The content, what the drawings say is important. And we spend too much time on the graphic representation instead of the depth and detail, what the drawings actually mean and do. So you can look at that in the book. Now, there are blogs. This one is particularly, we're doing one right now. I will post it, email it to uh, uh, Nadia at the end of the semester. This one is a really good one to look at. There's the address at the top, it's recorded. So. Seeing Environment 2020, if you go on that blog, you see the exercises the students are doing in my master class with me. I allow undergrad students, planning students, forestry students, civil engineering students, because they all need to design with the census. And that's what this course is learning uh, and, and teaching with the book now. And these are some of the exercises. So they are blindfolded for two minutes, and then they have to draw a mystery object which I give them. And it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It's an eye opener. When they do that, they really realize how complex it is and when they design. Or this person, we talk about how a stair actually works. So we use animation and how things work and how we are actually, how, how does the movement, what's the handle? How does the handle relate if you are visually impaired? How high, how is it comfortable? So the students, are not only learning this by experience on site, on campus, we go around. We actually mostly on site. Tomorrow, you will love this. I take the students to Granville Island to eat. 9.30 in the morning, they get a whole slew and then they have to measure, they have to document it. Sour, you know, pickles, you know, not like just sweets. Pickles and cake and all these different, or a hamburger, the layers, and they have to draw that. And then, this is the analytical part. They have to also document it. This is a lemon. And what happens with the lemon? This student, Michelle, Marissa, was one of very amazing work. And she started to really start analytical drawing and analyze uh, and go really deeply. This is one of my favorite drawings. I hope it works. Yes, it does. This is her way of interpretation when she peels an orange. What happens when you squeeze the orange, the, the, the smell coming out of it when you squeeze it. This is her animated drawing of that. So she uses drawing as an analytical tool to really deeply understand what's going on. And then at the end of the seminar, this is just one, um, they have to do a summer, summary poster just on that. And I'm going to do that next week. But little tiny summary poster, like last 10, 20 minutes or so, they get very little time. So we do in class exercises and they have to do homework and readings. And the readings I chose specifically, they're really high end research readings we have. And it's really an important aspect. But this is just one of the um, uh, uh, summary drawings, what they learned. And 
Well, what's the future? Well, AI, we will have very soon artificial intelligence. We're working on it right now already. There's all the tools out. I have lots of colleagues who are experimenting with it. So the graphic representation will be soon done by the computer, which means we have even more time to go deeper with the census and really respond to when we design with the census to the places we are designing. This is a very long time ago, a sketch I did a perspective review. I love to use the perspective and play with it. This is kind of a hedge door with hedges and it's just an interpretation drawing. But I see the future, and this is me teaching outside undergrad students in a new course, fourth year undergrad I'm teaching called Environment Urban Form Infrastructure, um, where they use the, the cube method to learn to look at the landscape, multi, uh, not only multisensorially, but at the three different levels above, at grade and below grade to really understand that these are holistic systems working together. In a box, architecture can be very much controlled, landscape can't because of the climate. And so, uh, and the other impacts, you know, uh, groundwater tables and so on, which don't stop at the illegal boundary of a site. Uh, so I teach the students this. So site immersion, teaching outside and going multiple times to the studio project you're doing during the process, I think is a way forward. Uh, and I think this is the last image uh, I practice drawing all the time, as you can see in my garden here at, in Vancouver. Um, my partner photographed me secretly there. And I wanted to show you, <clears throat> drawing can't be taught, but it can be learned. Laurie one of the masters, one of a really good colleague of mine and friend, he, he always says that. And um, my job is to entice you, and Nadia's job is to make you passionate for it. But we cannot... It's like when you want to be a tennis player and you want to be famous like Federer, you have to put in the time. And the same goes with drawing. You can't just sit there and do it quickly. It takes years and years to get really good at this. And so what you can do is in your free time, when um, you idle or something, you can sketch. And I do this here uh, now on the tablet, but also I use it when I go to a coffee shop, still a little um, iPad you know, a, a little uh, sketch pad. But I thought it's important, this is the last image, that you see uh, how important it is to practice it. And I do it all the time. Like I said, last week in Palm Springs on the airport, I sketched just to um, explore. And my um, uh, Instagram, if you go on it, I show my personal personal work. It's not to be hipster and refined and smiley and all that. It's about failing. It's about struggling. It's about showing also the drawings unrefined. It's not about that. So if you go on that, you will see there's also rough drawings, but intentionally, because the drawing is only a tool. It's, we are not artists. We do artistic work, but the drawing is our tool of communication of our ideas. And the word ideas comes from the Greek word edine to see we are making the ideas visible to the professors or your bosses, or you later on a boss yourself to your interns. So that's the whole idea of this process. That's it. Any questions?